Exodus, once again, uh, class number 12 uh, in the series. The uh, title of this lesson, The Covenant Between God and Israel. Subtitle, God Gives Moses the Plans for the Tabernacle. So far in our study of the tabernacle, described in Exodus uh, chapters 25 to 31, we've briefly looked at the plans for the following parts of the tabernacle complex which includes the tent, the courtyard, the fencing, and the holy objects as follows. First of all, the Ark of the Covenant that was placed in the Holy of Holies, the table of showbread that was in the holy place, the golden lampstand or the menorah that was also in the holy place, the curtains, the boards, sockets, veils, screens, as well as the bronze altar for burnt offering that was in the courtyard, the court of the tabernacle itself, and the oil for the golden lampstand. All of these have been mentioned and described. In this lesson, I want to complete the description of the remaining elements and other details given to Moses by God concerning the tabernacle. And so we read in chapter 28 about the garments of the priests, chapter 28, beginning in verse one. Moses writes, uh, then bring near to yourself Aaron, your brother and his sons with him from among the sons of Israel to minister as priest to me. Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. You shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for uh, beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful persons whom I have endowed with the spirit of wisdom that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister as priest to me. These are the garments which they shall make, a breastpiece and an ephod and a robe and a tunic of checkered work, a turban and a sash, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother and his sons, that he may minister as priest to me. They shall take the gold and the blue and the purple and the scarlet material and the fine linen, linen, excuse me, linen. So at this point, God uh, pauses uh, his description and plans for the tabernacle itself. And he begins giving instructions to Moses concerning the ones who would actually be offering the sacrifices, the ones actually uh, who would be serving in the religious duties uh, at the tabernacle itself. Before this time, uh, others performed the priestly functions, uh, mainly offering animal sacrifices. These things were usually carried out by family heads. If we go back, you know, Abraham, for example, built altars and offered sacrifices. Uh, we read about that in Genesis chapter 12. There also is the example of Jacob offering uh, a sacrifice on an altar that he built to commemorate God appearing to him at Bethel in chapter uh, Genesis 35. So the practice of offering sacrifice had long been established, but until now there was no uniform sacrificial system in place, nor was there any priestly class appointed uh, by God to this particular task. Since the nature and practice of the newly formed nation's religion would involve a systematic and orderly practice of animal, food, wine, incense, all of these things being sacrificed mainly by fire. There needed to be both a place, the tabernacle, and the people, the priests and the Levites to carry out this work and maintain its location. Uh, thus far, God had instructed Moses in the building and the assembling of the tabernacle, but here in chapter 28, the Lord specifies who would serve as priests. This would be Aaron and his four sons. And then he describes the garments that these would wear in the performance of their duties. And so God first describes what Aaron, who would serve as the high priest, would wear uh, while serving in this role. First, an ephod with only, uh, with onyx stones uh, on each shoulder, Exodus 28. The, uh, the breast piece, which carried 
inside, it was folded and you could put something on the inside, carried the urim and thummim. These were something like die, if you wish, that they would cast to make decisions, yes or no, to find God's will. There was the robe, Exodus 28, and a turban with a gold plate uh, on it, a tunic, as well as a sash. These items were only worn by the high priest. And so the chapter ends by describing the garments worn by both the high priest as well as all others who served as priests. Uh, those who served as priests wore tunics, uh, sashes, caps, linen breeches, which were pants that were secured around the waist and went down to below the knees or to the, uh, to the ankles. With his selection of Aaron, God consecrated only one family uh, to serve as uh, priests. We learn that not long after they were confirmed as priests, two of the sons, Nadab and Abihu, were put to death by God for having burned strange or unauthorized incense on the altar. The other two sons, however, served faithfully. Ithamar is mentioned later on in Exodus 38 in connection with the actual building of the tabernacle. And one of his descendants also served as priest, uh, Eli, we read about later on in the Bible. He was Ithamar's descendant. And uh, Aaron's other, th uh, other son, Eleazar, also became the high priest after Aaron died. We read about that in Numbers chapter 20. One of his descendants was Zadok, uh, who served as uh, high priests uh, later on. I want you to note that while the tribe of Levi became the tribe from which the priests came, not all Levites were priests. Only those from the family of Aaron could qualify to serve as priests. And the high priest was chosen always from that family. Now, later on, the men of the Levitical tribe distinguished themselves at a critical moment in their service to God. We read about that in Exodus 33. And as a reward, uh, they were set aside as a priestly tribe and they were commissioned to be the exclusive helpers to the priests, similar to deacons uh, today in the, in the church. They had a similar role. As a result, all the priests were Levites, but had to be descendants from Aaron's family lineage. And all those who served at the tabernacle and later the temple were also from the tribe of Levi, but from different families in the tribe of Levi's. Teachers, for example, rabbis, Pharisees, these were from various tribes since they were not involved in the sacrificial system or the rituals themselves. So the you know, rabbis came from you know, different, different tribes. Uh, the priestly garments, uh, again in Exodus 29, uh, one to nine, um, were consecrated before they were worn uh, by, uh, by Aaron. And we read about this in the following chapter, chapter 29. It says, now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them to minister as priests to me. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread and unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers spread with oil. You shall make them of fine wheat uh, flour. You shall put them in one basket and present them in the basket along with the bull and the two rams. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the doorway of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. You shall take the garments and put on Aaron the tunic and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breast piece and gird him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. Then you shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. You shall bring his sons and put tunics on them. You shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, and bind caps on them. And they shall have the priesthood by a perpetual statute. So you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. 
So once Aaron and his sons are chosen to serve as priests, God instructs Moses in this ritual to perform in order to sanctify or to set apart these individuals for the particular work uh, or service that God has intended only for them. In this case, it was to confirm that Aaron and his sons and their descendants would always serve as priests to the nation of Israel. Now, in this passage, we see that the high priest wears the tunic, the robe, the ephod with the breast piece attached. And finally, the turban with the gold plate uh, with the words, holy to the Lord uh, engraved on it. This order of dress was to be repeated uh, by Aaron and followed by every high priest that came uh, after him. Uh, note also that Aaron's sons, uh, as well as every priest uh, who would come after them, wore much simpler garb. Tunics, sashes, which were used like belts to pull their clothing tightly onto their bodies. They also wore caps on their heads. Serving perpetually as priests meant that so long as the law remained in force, no one from any tribe other than Levi and no one from any family other than Aaron's family uh, would be allowed to serve as priest or high priest. Perpetual in this context does not mean forever, but rather as long as the conditions permit. So we go to the consecration ceremony, the, ordinar the ordinar <laughs> ordination ceremony uh, followed this procedure. First, the presentation of the offerings that accompanied the ordination. Uh, a young bull, two rams, unleavened bread and cakes, and unleavened wafers in a basket. These were presented to the Lord um, uh, and um, represented by Moses. And this was done uh, when the tabernacle was completed. And sometimes it's a little confusing, you know, uh, God is giving uh, the uh, Jews or giving Moses to give to the Jews uh, ordinances and laws, uh, many of which would only be fulfilled once the tabernacle was uh, built. Uh, and so it wasn't happening right away. You, we're just getting the plans of what they ought to be doing or you know, will do once the tabernacle is complete. And in the following chapters, we read about the tabernacle being complete and then beginning to uh, fulfill these uh, requirements. But anyways, as far as the, uh, the consecration ceremony is concerned, uh, these were the uh, elements that had to be uh, presented or sacrificed. Next, uh, the priests were washed with water, most likely in the laver that was situated in the courtyard uh, exactly for that purpose. Then Moses was to dress Aaron with the high priest's special garments explained earlier. And then Aaron was to be anointed with oil poured on his head, a ritual used to denote that a person was being chosen or uh, set apart for a special role or task. Uh, many times this was done for prophets or kings, or in this case for priests. And then Aaron's sons are dressed for their particular service. We read about that in verses uh, eight and nine. Then there was the offering and the consumption of the sacrifices which were sacrificed in the following order. First, the bull as a sin offering. This offering was done to atone for or take away the sins of the priests that were being ordained. This established the core idea that sin causes death and a life must be offered to remove sin, to atone for or to redeem sin. So there's always death involved. Before Aaron could offer sacrifices to atone for the sins of the people, a sacrifice had to be made to atone for himself, since even if he was the high priest, he was still a man and thus he was still a sinner. Then the offering of the first ram uh, in Exodus 29, 15 to 18, as was done with the bull, Aaron and his sons laid hands on the animal. It was killed 
and blood was sprinkled around the altar. Then the animal was cut up and washed and then completely offered on the altar. Nothing was kept of the animal. So the sacrifice was to signify thanksgiving and gratitude to God, a whole offering, whole burnt offering, everything uh, was offered to God. Then they offered the second ram. This ram is called the ram of ordination because its blood was used not only to make atonement, but primarily to ordain Aaron and his sons. This was signified by first dabbing the blood of this ram on the lobe of the priest's right ear, on his thumb and on his big toe. This signified the dedication of the entire person to God. After this was done, the ceremony continued by sprinkling the animal's blood around the altar and then part of the animal along with part of the unleavened bread were burnt on the altar again as a burnt offering. The remaining pieces of the second ram and the leftover bread were to be eaten by the priests at the door of the tabernacle. Whatever was left after that was burned. Uh, then this offering of sacrifices and consumption of food was to be repeated each day for seven days, after which not only the priests were ordained for ministry in the tabernacle, but the altar where the sacrifices were made was also consecrated for use. Now, we often read in the Old Testament that certain types of sacrifices were made and required. However, no explanations are given. So here are a few definitions to help us sort these uh, out. First, there's the uh, sin offering or guilt offering. We read about this in Leviticus chapter four to six. Uh, sin offering was to atone for sins against God. Guilt offerings addressed sins against other people, also included paying for damages. The meat belonged to the priests for food in such sacrifices. Then the burnt offering described in Leviticus chapter one, this sacrifice represented complete surrender to God. An unblemished male animal bears the worshiper's sins and dies in his place. The animal was completely burned up and there was no meat left for eating. Then you had the grain or the meal offering. These were given to God in thankfulness. Fine flour, unleavened cakes and roasted grain were used. The priest would throw a symbolic handful at the altar and keep the rest for personal use. Then there was the fellowship or the peace offering described in Leviticus uh, chapter two uh, and in other places, chapter seven. This offering symbolized fellowship and peace with God through shed blood, through sacrifice. After some meat was ceremoni ceremonially waved and given to the priests, worshipers and their guests uh, could share the feast as a meal taken with God. The thank offering and the vow offering and the free will offering were all different types of peace offerings. And then you had the wave offering or the heave offering. These refer to a type of ritual action where the sacrifice was first, you know, it was waved in some manner before being placed on the altar. The movement of waving the sacrifice towards the altar and then away from it signified presenting a gift to God and receiving it back in some manner. A heave offering was a sacrifice completely dedicated to God. And then you had the, the daily offerings. It is in this passage that God instructs Moses that each morning and each night a one-year-old lamb is to be offered as a burnt sacrifice. In other words, completely burned with no leftovers uh, remaining to serve as food. Uh, they were also to add a portion of fine flour, oil, and wine so that the total sacrifice would represent parts 
of a complete meal. This instruction was carried out even uh, to the times of Jesus. They were still doing the morning and evening sacrifice when Jesus uh, uh, appeared. Now, the results of this consecration of the priests and the tabernacle are written about in chapter 29, verse 43. It says, I will meet there with the sons of Israel and it shall be consecrated by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate Aaron and his sons to minister as priests to me. I will dwell among the sons of Israel and will be their God. They shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. And so the purpose for the complex and demanding rituals was to keep Israel mindful that this was no ordinary place, but actually the place where God met with the ones who served as their mediator with God, and that was the priests. This place and what God had given them through the anointed priesthood, which was the sacrificial system, assured the people that he would be with them uh, now and of course into the future. In chapter 30, uh, we read uh, that uh, the Lord's instructions to Moses uh, concerning the building of the tabernacle complex and objects that were found in it, the garments worn by the priests, their consecration and some of their duties. Four things remain. First, the altar of incense, spoken of in Exodus chapter 30, verses one to 10. The altar of incense was an 18 inch square table. It was three feet high with horns on each corner and rings with poles for carrying and a, a molding around its top. It was made of acacia wood and all of it was covered with gold. It was placed in front of the veil that led into the Holy of Holies where the ark was located. Each morning and each evening, a priest was to burn fine incense, which was made especially for this purpose and, and for no, no other purpose, just for this purpose. Uh, this incense, this special incense was burned on this altar so that there was always a fragrant aroma in the uh, tent uh, 24 seven. No other strange or unauthorized incense was to be used for this twice daily ritual. And this is why uh, we learn that Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons were killed uh, because they offered unauthorized or what was called strange fire on the altar of incense. No burnt meal or drink offerings were to be made on this altar, except on the once yearly day of atonement, when the high priest would sprinkle the blood of the sin atonement, which was sacrificed on the altar that was located in the courtyard, uh, and then would be brought into the holy place and sprinkled on the horns of the altar of incense before going into the Holy of Holies to do exactly the same thing on the Ark of the Covenant. So the sacrifice was made on the uh, altar in the courtyard. The blood was brought into, sprinkled on the altar of incense, and then the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies and sprinkle that blood on the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And so the cloud that was produced by burning the incense would represent the presence of God with his people um, located in the Holy of Holies. Um, in other words, God dwelled there in the Holy of Holies uh, above the Ark of the Covenant, above between the angels, that's where God dwelt. Um, a second thing that is described is uh, a tax, uh, a tax. Uh, the emphasis here is how the tabernacle and its work would be funded. Uh, a half shekel paid by each adult 20 years and over, according to census records. 
So this tax was seen as a form of personal dedication to the Lord for those who were not priests. Just as the priests purified uh, and the objects in the tabernacle were consecrated, the people themselves were devoted to the Lord by offering this tax to sustain the priests and to sustain the tabernacle. In other words, they participated in all of this through the paying of this uh, tax. And then one other uh, object, uh, and that is the bronze laver in chapter 30, beginning in verse 17. Uh, it says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, you shall also make a laver of bronze with its base of bronze for washing and you shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet in it. When they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Or when they approach the altar to minister by offering up in smoke a fire sacrifice to the Lord, so they shall wash their hands and their feet so that they will not die. And it shall be a perpetual statute for them, for Aaron and his descendants throughout their generations. And so the, the laver uh, was to be used for ritual washing of the priest's hands and feet every time he was to enter the holy place in order to minister in that area, or he entered the tabernacle courtyard to offer sacrifice on the bronze altar. God wanted the tabernacle to be considered a holy place because of his presence there. This was reinforced by the command that to neglect to wash would result in death. And we knew this was a serious thing. There was also a command not to burn any type of incense, but only the prescribed type of incense. And uh, Nadab and Abihu, uh, you know, they violated that, uh, that observance and uh, were killed uh, for it. So these, commands, God was serious about these, uh, about these commands. Next, uh, we talk about the anointing oil in chapter 30. That was for the menorah, to keep the menorah lit. God provided instructions for the production and the use of uh, a special type of anointing oil, which was only to be used by the priests in connection with their ministry at the tabernacle. God deemed it to be holy and whatever it anointed, whatever it anointed became holy. Uh, this was uh, meaning separate unto God uh, and for his purpose. Whenever you hear holy, this is holy unto God. It means he's taken it and made it separate for his own particular use. This is why personal use was forbidden uh, of the oil or, or the incense, because it was holy. It was, uh, it was designed to be used only in the tabernacle, only for God's uh, specific purpose. And then there was the incense that talked about in chapter 30, verses 34 to 38. The instructions for making and using the incense were similar to the ones for uh, making the anointing oil. Uh, a detailed recipe is given the required ingredients were rare and expensive. The incense itself was to be regarded as holy. No one was to produce or use it for personal use and breaking this rule again, punishable by death. This incense was primarily used on the altar of incense located in front of the veil that hid the Holy of Holies from view and separated it from the other room, the holy place. And so we get some uh, final instructions uh, from uh, cha in chapter 31. Once the commandments and the plans for the tabernacle are given to Moses, God also appoints and empowers with wisdom and ability two craftsmen who will direct the construction of the tabernacle, uh, Bezalel and Oholiab. Uh, these are the two men blessed with special abilities uh, who would uh, design and who would uh, make uh, many of the objects uh, for, the, uh, for the use in the tabernacle. After this, God reviews briefly all of the items he has previously described to Moses 
from chapter 25 to chapter 30. He then reviews once again the importance of keeping the Sabbath day holy. Otherwise, all the commands concerning the tabernacle and the spiritual exercises performed there by the priests on behalf of the people would be of no use. If they violated the Sabbath, what was the point of going in and you know, offering sacrifice uh, to God? So most of the uh, instructions given to Moses had to do with the building of the tabernacle, its furnishings, the garments for the priests, and the details concerning their service before God on behalf of the people. The command to keep the Sabbath, however, did not require the use of the tabernacle or the service of a priest or a sacrifice of any kind. It was strictly something between the individual and God. And uh, the Lord uh, reinforces uh, this idea one last time before Moses leaves the mountain in order to bring the people uh, the law of the covenant and the plans for the tabernacle and the place where God will meet with the Israelites, the people chosen to be in this covenant relationship with him. So uh, we see God giving Moses the information, repeating the information, explaining the information, you know, to make sure that it's clear uh, so that when he returns to the people, he will be well versed in not only the covenant and the covenant uh, observances, but also the tabernacle and what the tabernacle uh, is to be used for. Well, we'll stop here in our textual study and we'll take a look at perhaps a couple of uh, lessons here. I think there's uh, actually, usually I do two or three, but uh, I think there's really only one practical lesson that stands out from this section which is filled with commands and regulations. And the lesson is this. Christians need to understand and accept the fact that there is a real difference between what is holy and what is not holy. What is holy and what is secular. What is spiritual and what is uh, temporal. God went to great lengths to teach his people this particular lesson. I mean, the food laws, you know, what was clean, what was unclean. Uh, the regulations concerning their worship. There were things that were holy. There were people that were special and holy because they were set aside to be treated differently. Their work was different. Certain days were ordinary, but others were holy. The Sabbath, uh, day was holy, it was different, it was set apart. The day of atonement, for example, that was not just another day, that was a special day set apart. All of this pointed back to God who was holy and who wanted his people to be holy. And these guidelines helped the people develop the virtue of piety. Uh, a definition, if you wish, a pious person is a person who shows respect for the things and the actions and the people that are holy. I repeat that. A pious person is a person who has and shows respect to the things and actions and people that are holy, that have been set aside by God for a special purpose. A pious person, for example, has respect for God as well as the people and uh, for the things of God. You know, today we're seeing in the world the democratization, democratization, there we go, uh, of everyone and everything. You know, corporate presidents uh, of multi-billion dollar companies employing tens of thousands of people they dress the same as the intern in one of their companies uh, that works in the mailroom. We treat presidents and those who have achieved great things because of skill or courage. We treat them in the same way as we treat the guy uh, who's never had a job. 
we pay no respect to anyone and we, that's like our badge of, of courage. You know, it's our badge of belonging to this uh, generation. We're not impressed by anything. That's fine for a society where everyone is human and no one is perfect, but it can't work like this in the church because here God is among us. His presence is among us through the Holy Spirit who dwells within each person, who is the source of the word of God. His word, the Bible, uh, uh, gives us the will and the purpose of God, especially in his uh, interactions with human beings. The word of God, it's a book, but it's not just any book. It's a book that has been set aside by God himself for the purpose of teaching man about himself, about God, and teaching man the future, what is going to take place in the future, and teaching man about his own condition and how he can change his condition uh, from lost sinner uh, to saved uh, saint. Uh, uh, the practices of God are separate. Uh, baptism and communion, these are not things that men invented you know, for religious purposes. You know, a parade, a religious parade where we hold, we hold up, you know, pictures of Jesus or Mary and, and we have a band playing and we have somebody dressed up in religious garb, uh, carrying a cross, you know, and walking down the main road of the village or the town. You know, that, that, that's a human ritual invented by a man, by a human being, but baptism, and communion, these two rituals are given to us by God himself. They are holy, they are set aside, they require respect, they require that we treat them in a different way. Uh, God is among us be, uh, with his command that we love one another. Uh, his body is present uh, in the form of the church. We are the people of God today. We are the people set aside by God for a special purpose uh, today. We look like everybody else. We talk like everybody else. We have to earn a living like everybody else. We get uh, COVID like everybody else. You know, we're not spared anything. But in essence, we are the people of God. We have a special purpose. We have a special work to do. God's ministers are here, the preachers and teachers, the elders, the deacons, all of these are appointed servants. They are consecrated within the church to do a special task on behalf uh, of the Lord. And of course, his people are here, the chosen people. The chosen people are the people who have chosen Christ as the savior. As you choose Christ, he chooses you. As you obey Christ, he brings you into a separated assembly called the church. And through that separation, we become holy, a special, a special people. And so God's presence demands piety, respect, and that means that our words, the way we dress, our attitude is different when we're here to worship God. Where God is, where God's things are done, where God's holy people gather. We need to make an effort to separate what is holy from what is unholy if we wish to draw nearer to a holy uh, God and our God is, if anything, he is holy and he requires us to be holy as well. All right, well, that's uh, our uh, lesson for today. One more to go. And I pray that you'll be with us uh, for that as we uh, wrap up the book of uh, 
the book of Exodus. And uh, next time I'll be uh, giving you information on where you'll be able to get some great additional resources that we are providing uh, for this book. So we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.